So uh, today's presentation is going to be talking about spectrum analyzers and network analyzers. It's kind of an overview, I'll we'll take over it kind of quickly. If you've looked around the room, you see an array of boat anchors. And we're encouraging everyone to take one home, please. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Well, By way of introduction, going beauty before age, Nicholas Blomstrand, working for HBI right now. Prior to that, uh, working with uh, Clear Channel, he was one of the people who ran around the country, tuning up directional arrays, graduate, electrical engineer, University of Wisconsin in Madison. In Madison. The dad, John Blomstrand, with... Uh, Minnesota Public Radio now, and previously HBI, and previously Clear Channel, and previously Minnesota Public Radio. And, uh, yeah, I to walk to there. Me, I'm just the old guy. Um, <laughs> founder of Consulting Incorporated, and a shameless plug, Consulting LLC Wisconsin lives on. These two are the proprietors of them, a dubious distinction at best. And from that, we'll kind of go on with the, with the presentation. Spectrum analyzers and network analyzers. First thing we want to talk about is something much more basic. I hope everybody has had a chance to play with an oscilloscope. The oscilloscope is just a device that plots the amplitude of the signal versus the time of the signal. And it's very, very good at looking at things like single frequency things, side waves, square waves, and so forth. But if you put a multi multiplicity of significance, for example, just connect an antenna to it, you're just going to have a bunch of crap, you're not going to be able to know what's going on. Here's a representative boat anchor that happens to be one of my favorites, Tektronics 2230. It says that it's a digital storage oscilloscope, but this oscilloscope operates completely in the analog domain. Only the storage is digital. And we're going to be talking about instruments that are digital and instruments that are fully analog. And then, of course, there is kind of a meld in between for a few of them. Looking at the time domain for an oscilloscope, it's really rather simple. We trace a dot across a fluorescent screen, or in some cases we might have, a, have an LCD display. Um, that's something new and foreign to me. Um, but we're just going to basically stretch that signal out and look at it in the time domain, and we can trace what the shape of that signal looks like. Now, in reality, however, we could also look at the same signal in the frequency domain. And if we were to plot this and on the right, the frequency domain would simply be one pip because what we're looking here is a single frequency signal, not much else going on beside, besides that. A spectrum analyzer will do this for us automatically. It plots, same thing as an oscilloscope based on time, it plots based on frequency. And like an oscilloscope, we can adjust amplitude and spectrum scan and so forth. And it gives us a much better indication of what's going on with multiple frequency signals and complex signals, mm -hmm. what's going on. So, for example, if I were to take two signals and one of those is 300 megahertz, and the other one is 50 megahertz, and I were to mix them, and now I'm not adding them together. It's very important. We're not adding them together. We're mixing them. And mixing them is a product. We're really multiplying the two of them together in a mixer stage. You can see those two signals separately below, and you see that kind of mishmash that comes out of the mixer. Putting it on an oscilloscope is not really going to tell us very much. Another thing we want to look at is some simple signals might not be as simple as you think. Looking at the top, we can start with a square wave, and beside it, I've overlaid a sine wave of exactly the same frequency to it. Below, you can see the fundamental and the third harmonic, and then the fundamental and the third and the fifth, and then the fundamental and the third and the fifth and the seventh, and the last one in the lower right-hand corner is a whole bunch of odd harmonics. As you can see, the more odd harmonics that we add to the fundamental in the proper amplitudes, we will approximate a square wave. And that is something that we can call Fourier analysis. There is a mathematical representation between square waves and sine waves, triangular waves, sawtooth waves. In fact, any periodic function can be decomposed into a series of sine waves. On the top, you can see the red trace, which shows uh, a sinusoidal presentation on top of a square wave. And below, you can see the frequency domain of the individual sine waves. In reality, we're looking at 
at two representations of exactly the same thing, one in the time domain and one in the frequency domain. And these are mathematically related. And we have this person, Joseph Fourier, to thank for it. Back in the 1700s, 1800s, he worked this out in pencil and paper about how it was really wonderful that you could convert one to the other. But to try and do it in real time in 1800 would have taken, you know, more time than he had. Um, so it was a mathematical exercise back then. But today, with the present day computing horsepower that we have, and something that has been developed called the fast Fourier transform based on Fourier's work, we can do this in real time. So let's look at a representative boat anchor that we do not happen to have here. This is an audio spectrum analyzer. You might think, well, why would anybody use <laughs> that? Well, this is very valuable if, for example, you want to take a look at speaker crossovers, or if you want to analyze uh, performance of an equalizer, make sure that uh, phonograph, anybody remember what a phonograph is? The phonograph <laughs> amplifier is actually keeping that RIAA curve, for example. This basically will do it. What's on the spec spectrum handler right now is a representation of a square wave. This might be something you're more familiar with. RF spectrum analyzer happens to be one of my favorites. Uh, again, it is digital storage, but this analyzer is operating completely in the analog domain, processes it analog and only digitally stores it. So we've talked about digital and analog, and here's some comparisons between the two. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, or I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, uh, digital processing, but there are other people that will do that much better than me. Um, I'm going to concentrate really on mm -hmm. how the swept analyzer works, because that's a little bit easier to understand. The swept analyzer is based on a circuit that was developed nearly 100 years ago by Edwin Armstrong, super heterodyne receiver. And for those of you who uh, might have a little memory jog here, a super heterodyne receiver works because it has a RF front end and some amplifier. And there is that mixer that we talked about. We're mixing the incoming signals with a local oscillator, and because it's multiplying, it produces these products. One of the products is going to be a sum and the difference between the two. The difference between the local oscillator and the incoming signal is called the intermediate frequency. We amplify that. That's the part in green. We demodulate it, put it out through the audio amplifier, and then we have rock and roll. Unless you're on AM, at which point you have talk radio. Moving along, here is a spectrum analyzer that looks much the same. What are the differences? Uh, the first block, the RF input, you see that we have an attenuator and we have some adjustable filtering. In the IF stage, notice that we have adjustable attenuation and more adjustable filtering. And we have another filter there at the output called the video filter, which is post-demodulation. So we're looking at essentially a tone control, if you will. The real difference here is in that lower left-hand block that says sweep generator. And the sweep generator runs the local oscillator here, much the same as tuning the dial on the radio. The sweep generator also runs the sweep of the dot on the display. So we synchronize the frequency that we're looking at with the position of the drawing of the graph on the display. But essentially, a super heterodyne receiver. Here's something for an FFT. The front end could be something more conventional. It could be a software-defined receiver. Uh, once we get that baseband, we put it into an analog to digital converter, and from there on, it's just numbers. And from the numbers, we can calculate a whole bunch of things, including uh, fast Fourier transform to find the spectrum. We can demodulate it. We can look at quad modulation. We can put up constellations. This is above my pay grade, but it is well within Mr. Brophy's pay grade, and he'll be more than willing to confuse you more than I can about that. <laughs> One thing that we're talking about in this IF that I said was adjustable is something called resolution bandwidth. Now, resolution bandwidth means that we can contour the intermediate frequency to narrow or wide. And there's some reasons why we would want to do that, and it also introduces some problems when we do it. If you look at the third display on down, all right, and that should be running, right? Is it? 
Yes, it is. Yeah. All right. A third display on down are two frequencies coming in the front end of our spectrum analyzer, and they're relatively close together. Right above that, you can see that spike that's moving across. That's our swept local oscillator. And on either side, you see the, the images that it creates, the, uh, the sum and the difference with the local oscillator. As the difference frequency passes through the resolution bandwidth filter, that's at the top, and we're changing the resolution of the resolution bandwidth filter, the very bottom is what the display is going to present. As you see, the resolution bandwidth is rather wide. We lose the resolution on the display. We end up with a lump. And as we sharpen it up, you'll see we'll get back to the two pumps. All right? And this is adjustable on spectrum analyzers. You might wonder, why don't we just leave it in the sharpest all the time? Well, here's what would happen if we were to do that. On the left is a wide resolution bandwidth. On the right is a sharp resolution bandwidth. Now, we see a lot of detail on the right, but we also see noise. So there is a compromise. There is a trade-off between the two of these things. Matter of fact, there's a trade-off among all the kinds of things that we can change on a spectrum analyzer. In resolution bandwidth and the speed that we are going to sweep across the screen and the frequency span that we are going to use, all are going to influence the quality of the measurement that we do. And in some of these boat anchors, like that animal over there, the 7L12, uh, you start the sweep in the highest resolution bandwidth, and then you go to lunch. And maybe when you come back, you might have a complete sweep. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure Jim can talk about the kind of acquisition types that we might have in the digital analyzer. But again, the more data that you're trying to crunch, whether it's analog or digital, the longer it's going to take. So back to uh, spectrum analyzer displays. On the right, we have an indication of what's happening when we just get into the resolution bandwidth. The top one is, I believe, 300 kilohertz, and the bottom one is 30 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. On the left, we've lowered the resolution bandwidth in a different part of the spectrum to 3 megahertz. Notice a lot of noise has been generated there. So what are we actually looking at if we're looking for something? In the bottom trace, we've added the video bandwidth filter. We've taken it from, I think, 3 megahertz down to or three, 300 kilohertz down to 100 hertz. Notice down there in the uh, bottom trace, you see there's a little pip that we didn't have originally. So knowing how to run these kinds of things is going to lead you into actually seeing what you want to see or not seeing anything that you want to see at all. So it's, you know, that's, we're going to try and get to that today with all of these equipment that you see sitting all around the room. We're going to get to play with it <laughs> later on. Spectrum analyzer, uh, as Mr. Brophy has referred, gee, I haven't seen those things in years. This happens to be mm -hmm. one of my favorites, however, the uh, 2712. And this analyzer, although there is a little plug where the place that it says tracking generator, the reason is Tektronix and its infinite wisdom when they came out with this instrument said, you have all these different options but you can't have them all at the same time. So this analyzer, I opted for the increased resolution bandwidth cord and there wasn't room for the tracking generator. So the tracking generator is underneath it as a separate standalone unit. And Tektronix also made a pre-selector uh, so that if I'm looking at something that might have a strong out of band signal, for example, I'm looking at an FM and there's an AM right down the road, I can look at pre-selected automatic in the pre-selector without trying to build another extra filter. For them. This stuff is maybe, I don't know, 30, 35, 40 pounds. Yep. So everyone's aware a pre-selector is just a tunable filter. Yeah. Just to make it simple. Yeah. So uh, this stuff, maybe 30, 35 pounds, you might need one man and a small boy to carry it around. But then again, Tektronix has come up with a new solution. Mr. Brophy has graciously brought us one of these that we can play with. Um, instead of two men and a boy, you just need the boy. This is 6.6 .6 pounds with the battery. And I understand, Jim, if you don't need the tracking generator, it just runs on the laptop, right? On the USB port? Yeah, there's a, a, a different version. Okay. This one. Okay. Well, you probably need even a smaller one. 
Now notice that what this does not have is a display. So you need to have a laptop computer or subcomputer in order to run the software. When we get into, as I said, in the digital domain, once you have it as numbers, the world is your oyster. Here is signal view software. This is definitely above my pay grade to explain, but suffice it to say, you can display this data as a waterfall, as a constellation, as a spectrum, as anything you want. It's all there. And I understand that as more and more people ask more and more questions about, can I do this? The software will be upgraded and you will be able to do that. Now, before we get into doing the on-hands demonstration, I'd like to have talk about one thing that you can do with the spectrum analyzer. And as you see, we have a, a lot of equipment here already and didn't want to bring more stuff just to do one little explanation. This is something that you can do with the spectrum analyzer. Those of you who are in FM broadcast and maybe still have modulation monitors and more importantly, you may even still pay attention to them. Uh, if you would like to know if your modulation monitor is correct, in AM, it was very simple. Put an oscilloscope up and see when you pitched off that waveform. That was 100% modulation. In FM, not so simple. But the difference between AM modulation and FM modulation is in AM modulation, as you modulate, you push power into the sidebands and the envelope power actually goes up because it's carrier plus sideband. In FM modulation, the carrier power, actually the envelope power is constant. It does not vary with modulation. So in order to provide power into the sidebands for FM, we actually rob it from carrier. Using something called a Bessel function and some mm. formulas, we can calculate those particular modulating frequencies where all of the power will be distributed in the sidebands and away from the carrier. There are three frequencies down there, 31850, 13587, and 8665 kilohertz. If we were modulating an FM carrier with a pure sine wave, a low distortion sine wave, all we need to do is to plug it into the exciter input, advance the gain, look at the spectrum analyzer, and when the carrier nulls out, 100%. Simple, easy. Now, the reason I have three frequencies there is it's first, second, and third and quarter vessel null. The 3180, 31850 is good if you're looking at a wideband port. If you don't have a wideband port, you can only inject it into the audio section, 13587. This particular display is the 13587, which is something that I actually did at KQR, KQRS some years ago. It is very accurate, nice, easy field calibration. With that, I'd like to turn it over to John Nicholas, and we'll do that kind of dog and pony show. Gentlemen, it's all yours. <laughs> Based on what he was just saying about uh, uh, FM, you take raw power from the carrier and put it in the sidebands. If anyone wants to hear the demonstration of that. Okay. Kind of takes her to move on. Oh, it was right there. This is just an example. Don't mean to block. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep blocking. Um, so, this is uh, 911 KNOW. Um, we've got a marker on set of frequency. And in typical FM fashion, they're running HD audio. Um, so you can see the stone pipes on the upper and lower sideband. Uh, but you can see how during modulation peaks, the marker goes up and down, which is actually showing uh, power being taken away from the carrier to modulate the sidebands. So as George was saying about resolution bandwidth, we can raise and lower a resolution bandwidth to get either higher signal integrity and more clarity clarity, or we can reduce it, make it a wider resolution bandwidth, 
And now you can see basically real time modulation. But we lose clarity. Um, this is an early FFT based analyzer. So this guy uses a traditional swept front end as George was talking about. This generation is when they started to transition from a traditional analog swept front end to a uh, digital front end. So this is an SDR based essentially. But it's uh, fun. I mean, I just want to have some hands on with it. Feel free to hunt it around. Uh, this one's hooked up to a uh, large dot on the roof. It's pointed at this telephone. Um, it's a broadcast method. So so we want to look at an FM frequency. Uh, otherwise, we also have an AM on the roof. We could look at as well. Uh, it doesn't. Big crack. Now, the, about every 15 minutes, it's on self calibrates. Um, it only takes a few seconds. But... <clears throat> if anyone wants to mess around with the resolution bandwidth, different stations. Um, otherwise, we have various things set up. Um, this is a rough spectrum. I have pulled up of uh, the, uh, this is hooked up to an antenna on the roof. Again, this one's uh, channel 35 TV. So this is uh, five eyewitness news. Um, Dad, would you like to explain what you're looking for? So this is just a simple, uh, small uh, notch filter. So uh, using the tracking generator of this particular analyzer, uh, take the, uh, this is RF out, out. And if you, if you do, uh, uh, see where the tracking generator is. So that's just out to in. Uh, All right. About minus uh, 40 dBm. By the way, tracking generator is simply an oscillator output that tracks exactly on frequency with the dot of the spectrum analyzer. Okay, so in other words, what you're measuring, where the, where the IF is looking at, we have, we're injecting a signal at that point. So we can sweep filters. And and the reason that this is important, there's a, a multitude of different filters out there. Um, in this particular case, it's a notch. So if you're looking at a transmitter that is isolated from pretty much everybody else, so it's a standalone and you don't have a high RF environment or other multi-environment, uh, uh, multi-transmitter environment, um, if you're looking at the uh, uh, at second harmonic or third or anything that's outside of the main carrier, you want to notch the main carrier so that you can more accurately uh, look at at uh, the products that you are intending to get to. Um, I also did have down here is a band pass filter. Um, so if you want, if you're in a multi transmitter environment and, and you want to look at just a particular carrier. You tune that to that particular barrier and basically reduce or uh, uh, that reduction of everybody else. Um, so you know it, it depends on the situation that uh, that you're in um, and as to which way you want to go. The importance um, of that is you don't want to overload the front end of your analyzer. You're looking at a small uh, signal next to a very large signal. You can actually cause Front end overload, which means that the mixer product or the mixer, as George stated, on the front end of your oscilloscope can actually mix with a whole bunch of other internal products that's being overloaded, and it'll show you a bunch of garbage. Uh, it'll wideband noise that doesn't actually exist, carriers that don't actually exist. You need to not, or for an <clears throat> FM, for example, you need to bandpass filters so that you know. A uh, hundred kilowatt station that's on the same tower you're analyzing doesn't blow up the front end and a whole bunch of garbage. One thing in conjunction with that, one thing that is absolutely your friend is feed through uh, loads, potentially. 
attenuators, attenuators. So you always want to, if you are going into an unknown situation, attenuate, you can't over attenuate. You don't want to blow up the chronic network. Um, so more of these better if you can always subtract you can't uh, you can't fix your uh, front end once you move it up so uh, these are your friends bring lots of them um, this particular analyzer I bought in the early 90s uh, this is right it's the first generation of uh, I'm really, really light, but it's heavy as hell, and so it pretty much stays on the bench uh, for tuning exciters, uh, STLs, uh, etc. It too has a, a tracking generator, um, but it doesn't have a battery. Uh, it's not very portable. This little guy is—you uh, can take it anywhere. It's you know, literally anywhere. It's amazing. It's might be uh, the one that. Uh, one of the long term communications. Uh, so these guys over here are kind of a special breed. They are communication test sets. Um, so they do spectrum analysis as well, but they also do a whole bunch of other stuff. They're RF generators, they can do different modulation systems, <laughs> audio, uh, digital modulation, uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, for instance, you know, here's mine. Uh, you can talk into it. You can actually use this as a repeater, both in and out for uh, 450 megahertz radio. Um, just on the south side of the building here, we have the rate, uh, the railroad, uh, the light rail. And uh, with this guy, I can both listen and talk back to the uh, the railroad guys. And they'll go by. You really don't want to. That's not legal, but <laughs> they can. <laughs> This it, uh, General Dynamics is a much newer version of this HP. Um, all the same, except this guy is a little bit more capable. Obviously, the Spectrum is a whole lot better. Uh, but you can uh, you can use a whole lot of stuff with your generation. Is there still stuff on the digital on the all digital ones that an old analog one will catch that it can't? I got prime examples. I work with. A fluke sort of oscilloscope versus old school's analog. And we had this problem. We couldn't see it with a fluke. We threw an old analog scope, like, oh, levels down. It was retrace the trade the fluke couldn't trace fast enough to catch it or something. It was, it was averaging. It was something weird or wasn't showing up. And the newer one's better than that or kind of fix that issue. It really depends on each individual analyzer, which there was yeah. theory. Oh, that's okay. I, I kind of figured that answer. The current state of technology has eliminated that. Issue. Okay. As these will demonstrate later, um, the new analyzer, like this one from Tektronix and the other one that's on display, uh, those are called real time spectrum analyzers. Okay. And as long as you have the minimum of a pulse duration, which is, it's only a couple of picoseconds. Uh, it depends on the platform, but the, the simplest one that was the one that was floating around and and depending on your connected computer, maybe a hundred nanoseconds of event duration, and I got a hundred percent probability of capture. Yeah, it's it puts everything else in the after shame. But um, and then next up is just a traditional uh, spectrum analyzer, the band test, kind of older. Um, and then this is a fluke, just RF generator. It does internal AM and FM modulation, but we can use it to demonstrate um, transmission. Um, and I guess we'd like to let people. Um, let's demonstrate uh, Jim's oh, yes. brand new devices. Jim Brophy of Tektronics. He's going to give you all of them. I think he keeps thinking. Uh, so, this is the analyzer that George had in his presentation. 
the RSA 500 series. And really, same concept as that little guy, but this one has a battery so it can run off its own power or you can plug it in. Okay. Um, oh, it was on. Hey. Up there for a second, it did. Yeah, the remote's right there. Let's try this. Finish buttons. Three possible outcomes of any product de demonstration. Two of them are bad. <laughs> <laughs> Iron marbles. You betcha. So. Yeah. I got it. Here for a second. I got it. Hey. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is that's coming off of an antenna on the roof and uh, this is the channel 35 TV signal. And we just have it set up to look at it in a slightly different way. Uh, but it's the real-time signal. And in this case, this real-time spectrum analyzer architecture, the big difference between the classic swept tune stuff and the real-time things is that the swept tune ones had a very narrow capture bandwidth and they were really great at seeing a signal level and resolving frequency. And as they swept, well, okay, that's great, but signaling architectures evolved over time and signals got broader band, they started bouncing around the spectrum and that made the swept tube analyzers difficult to use for those kind of signals. Whereas this real-time analyzer technology gives you a broader capture band and, and hence the ability to capture those pulsed events or bursty kinds of signals that are only there for a moment in time at any given space in the frequency, right? Uh, so this is what we get to see. And then there are a lot of different ways to look at the signal. Let's use DPX, spectrum rate. but it's still there. Um, so <laughs> the thing on the left, that, that's the DPX technology that really speeds up the, the content to the display. So this is this lets you see what's really happening in your spectral environment, especially if you can, if you can zoom in a little bit, go to 40 megahertz, because that is the, the limit of the real-time capture bandwidth on this particular instrument. And then in the upper right, that's that waterfall display that we talked about earlier. And yeah, that's really fast. <laughs> there. So we can we can rescale those signals to see what's going on. And this gives you different ways to look at signals too. If there's a little low level interferer that would otherwise be lost in the in the grass on a display like this, you might see a faint dribble running up the, the display and it's like, okay, there's something consistent going on there and it's hiding in the noise level, but it's just big enough to give me a headache. So that different displays will give you different different ways of looking at things. And as was mentioned, we can demodulate the signal to I've just got Pull up a signal that I'm cheating. Just saying it. So this is the same signal because I don't know the modulation parameters of the signal you've got, but traces, vectors, points. So this. 
this gives the digital transmission world a lot of ways to look at a signal. So we can we can look at error vector magnitude, which is a big thing in vector modulated signals. That constellation diagram on the on the lower right can tell us in a very fast look what the quality of our modulation is. And if we've got problems in our transmitter, all those little red dots at the intersections, those are the, the data symbols that we're transmitting. And if they get big and fluffy, we've got a noise problem. If we start seeing things smear in arcs, that's a phase noise issue. Um, so it tells you some things really quickly about the health of the signal generation. So lots of different capabilities available in this current generation of analyzers. It just depends on what you need to do. There's all kinds of application specific things to support stuff like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and P25 radio and you name it. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on. So they don't do, nobody wants to do all of it, but bits and pieces are there for the, for the folks. So I don't want to run, run on too long. I mean, I'm kind of a gas bag. I could talk about this stuff all day long. So, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to tie up everybody's afternoon all, all day long. And we can certainly talk more about it. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, if, if you want to play with the thing here too, and, and this one also has a tracking generator, we can, we can do things with that. So, what else? Where do you want to go from here? Sure. I got spec network analyzer. Ah, hey, let's talk network analyzer. Now, since, since you broke it once, I'll see if I can break it a second time. I can break it better than you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I can separate you two. <laughs> you know, he's Ali. We always gave him the stuff. See, see how easy it would break. Because if Howard could break it, you know, Let's see if I Howard could break anything. We used to say he could break a brass ball with a rubber mallet. But, you know, so he was our torture tester. It's coming. It's thinking. Yeah. But it says it right there. It's thinking. <laughs> I have to. Since we we reestablished, you know, you, and now I have to reestablish the fact that I can do that screen. Here. There we go. All right. Okay, so now I only just I just gotta go go ahead and get back to where I was. Okay, so we're talking about making measurements with spectrum analyzers, and this is uh, a measurement that I found in a when I was doing some work for a AM station, and. Uh, I was just looking in their engineering file and I came across their NRSC annual occupied bandwidth measurement. And you know, you see where the red arrow is. What kind of concerned me was that the occupied bandwidth of this AM station was 166 hertz. I thought that might be a little narrow. <laughs> Anybody know what might be wrong with this measurement? <laughs> so there's no modulation. There is no modulation right. on this occupied bandwidth. So certainly it will pass. This was actually someone going out and doing that for a living. So not only does the instrument sometimes give you bad information, sometimes the person who's doing it does bad information. A shameless plug, Consulting LLC Wisconsin does these measurements and they do them correctly. Moving on. Network analyzers. A network analyzer is kind of a spectrum analyzer on steroids. It has many of the things that spectrum analyzer. Instead of one input receiver, it's got several, sometimes many as three. It always has a tracking generator output because in a network analyzer, we want to excite the network and then measure the results of it. And the interesting thing about a network analyzer, whether it's a scalar or a vector network 
analyzer is they can compare signals at the inputs with each other. So if we're comparing a vector network analyzer, we not only can get amplitude comparisons, but we can get phase comparisons. And what does that give us? In a standard spectrum analyzer, we will measure the magnitude of a signal. And that we don't know what phase relationship it is because we're not comparing it with anything. So in reality, we just have that blue vector is just the magnitude of the signal coming in. If we compare it with something, we can then characterize that signal as an amplitude and a phase compared with some reference. We can take that polar representation and turn it in mathematically to a rectangular representation, A plus JB. And of course, you're all familiar with impedances R plus JX, which is a rectangular representation of what would be impedance. Network analyzers make these polar to rectangular calculations for you automatically. One more concept is we all know that Ohm's law is resistance equals voltage divided by current. Well, that means resistance is volts per ampere. Very simple. Um, in the complex world for antennas, well, resistance impedance is also volts per ampere, but everything is complex. Once we can do the mathematics in complex math, we can then come up with things like reflection coefficients, which gives us standing wave ratio. We can do phase rotation, pair phase, which gives us group delay, all sorts of things that we can characterize in antenna systems and networks that drive antenna systems. So here's what a network analyzer looks like. This is the 8753C. We have that particular boat anchor sitting over there. Notice that it has four gazinias on it. One of them is the reference output. The other three are three receivers. And at the bottom is another box that all those plug into. And then there's two ports on the bottom box. That box happens to be something called an S-parameter adapter. Talk a little bit about that in a minute. Here's another version. We may have that over there too. It's the 8753ES. Same box, same idea, except the S parameter is built in. I talked about S parameters. Well, what is the topology of this? Well, before I get into that, that box that I just showed you before weighs about 75 pounds. You need three, 80 pounds. You need three men and a small boy to carry that. Here is a uh, Tektronix version, which I understand Tektronix has discontinued, but it's down at three and a half pounds, runs off of your <clears throat> network, runs off of your laptop computer, and uh, certainly a whole lot easier to carry around. This S parameter idea we're talking about, if you look on the right side, you see the analyzer with its multiple inputs. And then in the center, you see the S parameter adapter. Notice in that box, we have directional couplers and we have switching and mixers and filters and all kinds of other stuff in order to make this two port S parameter box. Well, what is an S parameter? This is a classic way of analyzing two port networks like filters. And simply put, there are four S parameters, scattering parameter. S11 means we are exciting port one, and we're looking at what's bouncing back out of it. That essentially reflection coefficient is going to give us SWR. We look at the next one, which is S21. That's exciting port one and measuring port two. That's transmission. We can see what the filter is doing. Now, S21 and S12, the other two parameters, are basically looking at the same thing, but in the opposite direction. Now, the four graphs on, on the right side show that what we have here for transmission, that would be S12 and S21, are roughly the same. It's pretty much a symmetrical network, probably something like, uh, well, maybe, it's, maybe it's a low-pass filter or shelving filter or something. But when we're looking at the match, that is the reflection mm -hmm. coming off of the input port, that's port one and port two, notice there's a big signal, signal suck out on port two. So it isn't really bi-directional. There's something different in between. This idea of S parameters gets into more engineering than we want to talk about, um, but it is a way of characterizing two port networks. If you don't have the S parameter box for the network analyzer, you have to outboard it yourself. And here is uh, network analyzer tools that we generally take with us when we're doing this work. The top is a NARDA directional coupler. This one has uh, really a workhorse 
it's from 50 to 1,000 megahertz for the work that we do, um, FM, TV, uh, microwave for radio, they'll cover all of that. As John had mentioned that pads are your <laughs> friends, yes, and especially, especially true in network analyzers. Balancing levels at various inputs is very important if you're going to want to get useful data. When we go out and we do AM work, there aren't really too many options for directional couplers. Um, Ron Rackley of Blessed Memory uh, developed the circuit for this AM directional coupler. He did a number of papers for the NAB uh, talking about using network analyzers to adjust and maintain directional antenna systems. So this is his design for a directional coupler. Uh, this is built by uh, Tunwall. Uh, we have some examples here that uh, actually we built ourselves. Um, Silver so circuit, not too hard to build. So once you have all these pieces, to, yes? If anyone's curious about these and the principles of how these work, I did print off a couple white papers uh, written by Ron Rackley on this design. They're over there. Uh, Taylor is back pointing at them. There's two different ones. One's on measurement techniques, and the other is on the operating principles of how this actually works. Ron was really an excellent, excellent engineer, excellent. So once we have all these pieces and we can put them together and plug the analyzer in, what's it gonna give us? Well, here we have actually on the left side is a scalar network analyzer. And on the right side, we have a display with a vector network analyzer. Uh, what we're looking at here is a filter. The one trace shows the passband transmission, that's the hump. And on the bottom, we're looking at the reflection coefficient or how well the match is. Uh, as we get into the pass band, you see that the reflection goes down, which is something that we like to have. Outside of the pass band is a short, which is means it, the filter is going to do what it's supposed to do. On the right-hand side, we have the very same thing in a vector network analyzer. At the bottom, we have the same trace. And up at the top, you notice we have that little red circular doohickey. That is a Smith chart. We're not going to go into the intricacies of a Smith chart. We're only going to say that it is probably the most useful thing that you can learn to use if you're going to be doing any kind of work in RF systems. Um, takes a while to understand and know how to work this. Uh, Nicholas, did you say that at UW you had like a whole semester on Smith chart? Two. Two semesters on Smith wow. charts to learn how to work. So we're not going to go into them except that it is a very valuable tool. If you would like to learn more about it, I recommend this book, written by Philip Smith. Uh, he was a professor at Tufts University. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote the book. At the time the Smith chart was developed, there were a number of people coming up and working on it at the same time. But in the United States, we attribute the Smith chart to him. This book I bought from the NAB bookstore. I think it's available on Amazon. Uh, buy one used because the, the, the real one is expensive. So let's take a look at something we're going to call the measurement plane. If I were to take a piece of transmission line, any old piece of transmission line, and I were to short one end of it, and now in the RF sense, not DC, but in the RF sense, look in the other end of the transmission line, I would probably not see a short. If I were to leave the other end open and look in, I would probably not see an open. What we would see is that unless that piece of transmission line was electrically exactly one half wavelength long, I'm not going to see the short with the short or the open with an open. The open or short at the end of the transmission line will be repeated along the transmission line every half wave. And somewhere in the middle, it's going to be something else. This graph at the top shows the voltage and current representation on a transmission line when it is shorted and open. And you can see that voltage and current alternate. Okay. Voltage and current, remember, is volts per ampere. This is just a representation of what the impedance looks like. Because we're measuring voltage and current on a transmission line, that's the impedance at that particular point. The next middle graph is showing what the reactants may look like. And this little, I wish I had a little better graph on this, but the bottom graph with the middle graph tells you that the reactants is either going to be inductive reactants or capacitive reactants. 
So it's going to go from zero to infinity and then from negative infinity back to zero and so forth. Again, this all repeats every half wave. Every quarter wave, it alternates. So you may have heard the term quarter wave stub tuning. tuning. A quarter wave stub means you open the end or short the end, and then you connect that to a feed line, and that basically is a notch filter. Very, very sharp notch filters, by the way. So knowing that this is happening in a transmission line, if we were to connect it to something that wasn't a short or wasn't an open, but somewhere in the middle, like maybe an antenna, and in this antenna, it's a 150 R plus or negative J20 approximately. As we move away from the antenna along the transmission line, you can see what the resistance reactance curves are. So if we actually wanted to use the analyzer with a piece of test lead to measure something, what are we measuring? We have to somehow establish the measurement plane to be at the end of our test lead. And we can do that. The analyzer has a calibration feature. Looking back at our friendly Smith chart once again, that circle you see in the middle that rotates around, we say that the, uh, and the impedance rotates. Uh, this is, will be represented on Smith chart as a circle. And that circle, as you see, goes around and around. The positive side of the Smith chart is capacitive reactance. Uh, no, inductive reactance. The bottom side going down is capacitive reactance. Going to the right side is going to an open or higher impedance. Going to the left side is short. So as you rotate around, you can see that the resistance is going up and down. The reactance is going back and forth as we rotate around. And every time we go around the Smith chart, that is one half <laughs> wavelength of a transmission line. The important thing to bring from this is I note three points on this Smith chart. At the far right, there is the open, that is zero resistance load across the transmission line. At the far left is the short, which means zero, uh, which means, well, excuse me, the open is infinite resistance and the short is zero resistance. And in, in the middle is what we have a perfect load. So if it happens to be a 50 ohm transmission line, that would be 50 ohms. <laughs> Knowing these points and knowing how a transmission line behaves, the analyzer can calculate the stuff that the transmission line is going to do to your measurement and calculate it out. So we can establish that measurement plane at the end of any arbitrary piece of test lead, test lead that we want. Now, one thing to remember, if we're talking about a span of frequencies, and normally we're going to measure over a span of frequencies, the electrical length of that test lead not only is its physical length, but it depends on the frequency of your measurement. So not only do you have to calibrate for length, you got to calibrate for every frequency that you're going to measure. So it is a process that the analyzer will do, and it produces a whole table of calibration factors so that for a particular calibration setup, the analyzer will be good for that particular piece of transmission like that particular test and can be calibrated out. Uh, how do we do that? That's that little box, and actually we're using it right there to uh, support the uh, the cell phone camera. Um, the uh, these are precision shorts, precision opens, and precision fifty ohm load in this case. I would say, what is a precision open? Well, mm -hmm. a precision open is actually where the end of that center conductor matches with the end of the outside shield. And it might not make a whole lot of difference, for example, at uh, AM frequency, but it certainly will make a lot of difference. Yeah, that, well, that's another one of those loads. Calibration load. And that, that, that mm -hmm. report, you know, a short and open and a, uh, and, a, and a load all in one place that you can't lose them. Like those, I can, I can lose them one at a time. Uh, once you do this, it establishes the measurement plane at the end. Okay? That's the quick synopsis of network analyzer. We have a couple here. That point, I'd like to just turn it over to John, Nicholas, to take a look at the network analyzers that are over there and any questions you might have and playing with the instruments as much as you'd like to. I would like to add most of the instruments here are devices. So just be gentle. 
we can set up just about anything you'd like to test, try and play, and it's all about hands-on. I like to get people to actually familiarize themselves with analyzers, try and understand what you're looking at, how to use them, the big differences between like, the older stuff over here versus the newer stuff, versus the brand spanking new ones that we've done in situation through cloud for demonstration. Looks like you have yeah. a field box. Yep. That's even again another yeah. step forward. These things, these things are so complicated that we actually have a uh, a small booklet that gives us step by step operating instructions for various uh, different types of tests. A field box is basically everything we have in this room wrapped up into one little handheld analyzer. It's an entire lab. Big single point. They're truly. Really I uh, just want to give the Zoom folks watching any questions that they have. Give it a couple seconds if anyone wants to unmute. Okay, none yet. Well, thank you for your time and have fun. <laughs> I'll just follow the Blomstrand dynamic duo around. It's got to say, if I want to show like number analyzer, we do have. This is a broadcast effort. We're going to show it. The, um, the difference is on two. Yeah. Sorry. So it's four chassis. So I guess we can use George's. That's right. Yeah. This is another variation of the calibration standards. So this is actually the 50 ohm load, but with two different connectors. And then this is the short, again, two different connectors. So you have, uh, you can go, it goes both ways. <laughs> You have your uh, toy still in your pocket, just so I can uh, show that off on camera a little closer. I didn't catch it quick enough. My mom didn't ship it every time we're going The case with the analyzer was going to take 96 pounds. FedEx looked when they started for that. Like, what did you order? Like, A workout is what you ordered. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it is a company that's no longer around. Uh, it's an ECFM. The model is, and the manufacturer is uh, it's I know that they around. They have been for a number of years. Oh, yeah.
not sure just exactly what the difference is. Um, we, um, here are two different types of brain antennas that are similar to this. Uh, and the um, the, I need a. Oh, yeah. Got that? We use you right? because CP of 500, the general ALCP, they look like pretty much a day I never quite understood why. But the RFS and different always work. General is always gives by this one. Really? I actually had pretty good luck with Jim for this myself. I've always noticed by uh, the issue that I've always had with Jim for us over time is the feet arm vibrates metal fatigues. Oh. The feet breaks. And there's a beautiful Smith chart. Not with the sun. It was kind of. That's a little wonky. Yep. These are all Like you said, this guy was tuned to The gentleman, you'll want to get the oh, antenna God. away from any metal objects. I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I had you. I had you muted on my speaker. Can you say that again? Yeah. Uh, the antenna. You want to get it away from any metal objects. Uh, ideally, ten feet, but uh, hard to do in this environment. If you held it up closer away from the analyzer, you might get some better results. Yeah, I know. This it is a non-metallic case on uh, or coating, but if I hold this, it's worse than if it's just sitting on the analyzer. Yeah. The human body it actually acts like an antenna, much Change, better antenna. Changes the uh, characteristics of the antenna by simply touching it. I can move this so much easier. We do have longer cables too. Uh, do you have any other questions? Uh, but of course. You'll notice the display changes tremendously as you move it around. Let's see. It's not a very good thing. Uh, uh, Nicholas, this is also uh, one of two bays. So this is uh, uh, just for demonstration purposes only. Uh, this is actually one of the, it's a two bay arrangement with uh, an inner, inner bay that uh, is specific length for the one way length uh, between right, and a T in the middle. Um, but yeah. honestly, you can run this a single day by uh, adjusting the arms and adjusting those two little uh, caps at the ends. Yep. And if you're running a multi bay arrangement, you'll usually find that each goal element is uh, relatively low resistance and relatively high inductance. That's usually how they do because you have to have the phasing right in order for the splitter to split properly. And this one shows exactly that. So it's relatively low in resistance. It's only 10 ohms resistance, relatively high inductance at 40 ohms of reductance. But uh, if anyone wants to try, you can feel free to try and mess with the tuning on this particular unit. You can just loosen this up. I have wrenches in this. You can change where the feed arm attaches to the actual element and you can change the characteristic impedances. Hey, it really works. Yeah. It does. Huh. Oh, dear. I'm glad. I, I know it worked last time I turned it on. <laughs> Two years ago. <laughs> so
So if anyone wants to try it out, feel free. You can do the antenna. Yeah. Be gentle. It's its first time. Yeah. <laughs> first time. And if you have any questions, let us know. We will answer these yeah. So just a refresher, as it comes in, this basically, this is the starting, where is the, this is the final measurement point, right? The, uh, the little carrot there is yeah. the marker, okay. which is, that, which you can roll around. Yeah, you can That's roll it around. Yeah. So the, you just hit marker and then you can roll it around to various frequencies all around. This yeah. What's what's it tuned to? Uh, 90.9. Which? 90.9. Marker 90.9, see how yep. good we are. So it's. 10 ohms minus, uh, plus 40. Yeah, this is for a multi for a multi band. Yeah. So that that's about yeah. what I would have expected. Um, you know, of course, if you're doing like an AM battery, uh, you hook into the common point. You want to see basically dead center. Yeah. That's all I ever think. Like, look at the dot. The dot's <laughs> happy on targets. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Now for something like this, the S parameter sets makes sense because we're just going to plug it one in. Otherwise, we'd have to have directional coupler pads and all that stuff. Right which is what I have to do here. Yeah. This is my analyzer, which I use all the time, graciously given to me by George. And uh, this is a much older analyzer, but it's a workhorse. Of course, you have the CRT, but uh, it's capable of doing the same thing. So we want to go to polar format and then measurement count. So we have to do scale, turn on our Smith chart. And then it's the same sort of thing. This guy's just a little bit older and a little bit different interface, but same thing. And your field box that you have is a lot simpler to set up and use than a multi port and license like this. Sure. Hey, George, just in case you're curious, yep. they make more than four ports. Uh, Rotor Sports makes it 42 ports. Four. How much? Oh, they're right around dollars. Uh, Forty-two ports. A little bit different than our little old four ports, or the uh, two port that Dad brought. This one is upgradable. Uh, this has a CRT blade in it, so the entire length of the box probably weighs thirty-five times by itself. Twenty-five minutes. Anyway, you now make a little uh, LCD screen. Oh. And it's around change deep and weighs about six ounces. They replaced the whole front of that, and it's a pumper. Yeah. Need a second wrench. This one's spinning. I believe this one doesn't actually do the pumper. It's well, maybe because I because this the analyzer doesn't help with uh, signal. Maybe not, but still, it it it, it does it is, use a lot of weight. Yeah, and power. This oh. 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 Right. So, if we touch it, just be gentle, don't break it. Uh, we do also have an external directional coupler. That has the NARDA out. Um, but the NARDA directional coupler that we had in the uh, presentation, we have that here as well. And we, have a bit of yeah, we can also use it to tune that guy with an external directional coupler. Uh, you can also put an amplifier in line, which is the main benefit of having a multi-port array. If you only have a two-port, you can do an amplified measurement. It just gets a lot more difficult. Um, I believe copper ring valve is the uh, okay. that's good. AM shape. directional coupler that we built. So it's the same yeah. one that the uh, same one you saw internally is the same one as the software. So it's the we same thing. So it's input. Output, it's basically a piece of coax that goes across, uh, but there's stubs based on the wavelength um, that give us sample reflect sample ports where you have your forward and reflection ports with minus 30 dB coupling. Um, and we hook these into the receive ports of the analyzer. We can take ratio and phase differentiation between the forward wave and the reflected wave. And that's how we tune the network. So it works across everything from DC to blue light. They all work the same way. The thing about <laughs> using this with the four port analyzer, this, this kind of analyzer, is in a situation where you have an AM direction and you might have six, eight powers, you need a fair amount of horsepower to excite the towers 
because in a direction of array, there's usually a couple in between them. And you have to put watts into it sometimes so that you can actually establish those fields between the towers. So something like this, you know, on its own is uh a lot something like that, not enough. So we will come out of there and then we will run it into maybe a 10 watt amplifier. And then take that and put, of course we put pads in all of this to make sure that all of our levels are correct going back into the analyzer. But then we can excite that array at a couple of watts, whereas the bare bones would not allow it. This analyzer will not allow you to do that, but you can't get into it. This one lets it configure any way you want. The added benefit to that is also noise. If we have if we push enough power forward, we can drown out everything we're not looking at. So if you have, let's say uh I just had this guy out at 9.50 a.m. Uh, last week, and there's a lot of gun noise. So you hook it up, put it through a, a uh, amplifier. You can actually get a large enough signal that after attenuation, it blows everything else out of the water. So it's the only signal that it can see because we attenuate everything else. This method, this analog, a pretty hefty amplifier was used by Ron Rackley when he was measuring antenna farms. Yeah, right here is the white paper on it. When he was measuring antenna farms at the Meadowlands in New York, where you have just a whole bunch of kilowatts, and nobody's going to shut off for somebody else. Yep. You have to overpower their You have to overpower them. Attenuators are your best friend. This analyzer, when it was well, when this one was new, it was right around 75 grand. Seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars, which is why we still run old equipped, because <laughs> the upfront cost of buying new is. But uh, okay. yeah, so works great. Um, I know you have a field box, and I also have the uh, your Ritsu. It's thirty. It's a little handheld network analyzer. It's basically this wrapped up in a handheld you know, like little white spray. You know. So, yeah, that's good. Feel free to play around with them, ask questions, send me questions. There's a lot of math, and I'm sorry about that, but are the new handheld ones as good as the old, you know, lab grade or lab type? Uh, Sure. Back to my so question. Sometimes, in some ways, yeah. they're better. In some ways, they aren't. Exactly. Uh -huh. um, so that guy has more dynamic range, better sensitivity, but compared to newer instruments, it's a lot slower. And so it's all about what do you need to accomplish? Because most people don't need the dynamic range and the noise floor of that guy because of the nature of transmitters and stuff like that. So that's really over-engineered for the overwhelming majority of work that happens today. Uh, so where, I, you know, the newer stuff is, yeah, it's cheaper, it's lighter, and it's, you know, it's quicker, and and it's plenty good for anything that anybody is. You know. I've worked with two different consulting engineers, and one brought this out and turned up the array. Another one brought out the little boxes and turned up the array. We have both. You go back and forth based on what we need. But I would take it for a break. So, like I said, I have I have this one obviously the thirty five seventy seven. I have one of these as well, and then I've got a little handheld analyzer. Exactly like you described, but it, it really depends. If, uh, for instance, one of them, one of the arrays that we're actually building right now in South Dakota, it's a three tower directional, uh, and it's out in the absolute middle of nowhere. There's nothing around so i can get out there go into each atu and i can measure everything locally with my little handheld analyzer and it's fantastic it does great but if we're you know tuning the mic over there we've called this analyzer for both of these out the 1500 kstp it's a 50 kilowatt in minneapolis with the yeah we have to have these guys we need the higher dynamic range we need the better noise for my handheld analyzer just opens, and there's nothing you can do about it. 
So it depends on the situation. Yeah. These will solve all the problems, but they're not convenient. But if you hurt your back carrying it around, how do you set it up in an ATU when it's way below out? I've done it. Yeah, times. it can be done, but you're like, with this guy in the case, um, uh, the last time I shipped it was to Atlanta. It was down there. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I believe ship went to 140 pounds. It's roughly 400 million bucks every time. Yeah. Not, not your go to if you don't have it. Yeah. yeah. A little handheld can carry it on a bucket. Yeah. Yeah. We used to have to do mom research on our array, you know, all the crop details. We took out there here, and it was, you know, one of these, a couple other things. You know, the next person hated it. Uh, it's like, what is this thing? It's like, you know, and I had to overnight to some calls, and there was an emergency time when I had to get there in three days. You shipped it. I'm like, okay, who's paying for this shipping? My GM is going to freak when he sees power. The shipping bill is paying. <laughs> My last job for I heard because we, I was on the road 300 days a year doing this. Yeah, this was my life. Um, we shipped six cases every week of that size. Yeah, um, my travel expense fell anywhere from eight to twenty thousand dollars a month. Yeah, did you wonder why consulting engineers are expensive? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, largely, it's just the uh, yeah the knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. I had to talk to somebody. I had to ship something here because we're you know you've got different size companies and Salem has a better ship rate because we ship so much stuff. And he's like, "How much does it cost you to ship this?" And he's like, "Can you ship it and fill it back, please?" <laughs> it's like a couple hundred bucks less. Money. Sure. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 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 shipping was still Oh, yeah. Can't yeah. yeah, buy one. Is it? Well, say radio shop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Best Buy barely has it. Best Buy has a lot. They sell TVs and that's about it. Yeah, TVs, appliances. Wait a little while. But, yeah. Oh. Uh, what Anything else you want to do? Okay. We have uh, quite a few of our LEDs come in. Uh, they're on the roof here. Uh, it's right out of the hallway. So it comes down. It's got about 100 different speakers. It goes all the way throughout the two buildings. We run a lot of satellites here. Yeah. If any of these, I haven't. I know a couple of people that have. They say some things they're good for. Uh, if you're in a noisy environment, that's not good. Yeah. You know, if you're a ham, you're setting up the radio at the hall. Yeah. Professional. like, what is going on out there in the universe? Like, if you see an issue, I go, I think the problem here, bring your fancier thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's an after that. It's an easy. Yeah. 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 See how it goes. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. How's it going? I think going pretty well. Um, although answers or questions answered. Seems like it. Um, I'm gonna sign off soon-ish. Zoom viewers, just to preserve what little battery I've got left in case uh, wolves decide to attack my car. But thank you very much, everyone, for dropping by. And thank you, Blomstrand, Blomstrand and World, for doing all this stuff. Take care, everyone. Appreciate Hubbard for hosting.